Sorry. So I would like to talk a little bit about the newer drugs in neovascular AMD and, and discuss a little bit about critical reading of the data for us to better understand when something is presented and not fall for anything that you know we hear. So VGF reigns supreme in vascular eye diseases, be it wet macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusion, idiopathic choroidal neovascularization. I'm extremely proud that I'm at the institution that they did all the basic and translational work for VGF and anti-VGF in these diseases. Here are the group of people that they were awarded with a Sampalimod award, also called the Nobel Prize in Ophthalmology, uh, several years now back. Uh, this work was done by Professor Miller, our chair, Professor Gregudas, uh, the previous director of the retina service, Dr. Adamis, who was one of my teachers when I was in residency, Professor Diamore, who is uh, in charge of uh, Skepens Research, Professor Aiello, who is over at Justin Diabetes Center, Professor King, George King, also at Justin Diabetes Center, and also Professor Ferrara, who was a genetic and he made the monoclonal antibody to the EGF. So anti-VGF has been the king in the vascular AMD. And since early in the beginning, we had a troika to control it. And that was the full length antibody Avastin, the FAB fragment, Lucentis, and then the, the VGF trap, the chimeric VGF receptor FC portion from general called aflibreceptor ileia. Although people keep fighting about which one is better, the reality is that you know they're pretty much equal. There is minor differences. And the real world data from the Irish registry showed that there is no statistical difference over you know, 10,000 people. So these are like the hugest, the largest number of data. So no difference. Actually, a higher percentage of patients achieve more than three lines of visual gain at one year with Avastin, Bevacizumab, compared to Ranibizumab or Aflibercept. And after multivariate adjustment, Aflibercept exhibited a greater low growth of more than three line visual acute loss compared with Bevacizumab. So these are small differences, but again, shows to us that there is no one better than the other, despite of what we believe or what is being easily taught in the, in the market. And we've done really good about eight to 11 letters of visual acuity gain happens over a year with the monthly dosing, with the most intensive dosology. Now this intensive dosology, we ever take, some people don't need that, but if you're going to look population, if you don't want to miss anybody, monthly dosing, it is not superseded by anything else for uh, getting the best visual acuity at the expense of over treating and burdening the system. But though we've done good, in reality, no loss of vision is 80% of the patients, 20, 40 or better is 40% of the patients, and three lines gain is 35% of the patients. So we always want more. Can we make it everything 100%? The truth is we failed. Probably there is nothing much left on the table from the wet component. However, there is still an unmet need, as we said about the burden of treatment, the duration how long the effect lasts, and you know, can we have a drug that can last longer? So a lot of effort has been put into that from the very beginning. I remember from Professor Adamis when he was working on mycogen literally 20, 25 years ago, but we haven't succeeded. But most recently, there have been two main drugs that have come out with the sole purpose of saying, look, we can go longer than this every month or every two months with ILEA. So I will go first with the Pulsar study, which is the ILEA high dose, eight milligrams in 70 microliters, so 50 microliters, which is a little bit easiest to understand. So the claim here, they said, look, we did the study, we gave eight milligrams versus two milligrams of filibercept, high dose, and we were able, 80% of the patients, to go every three to four months, therefore every two months, after the first initial three monthly doses. And they said, look, you know, this is a good thing. Look at the anatomy at four weeks. 
60% to 55% versus 50% of the patients have central subfield fluid resolution at week four. See, we're better, you know, if we could do that. However, they put in, in, in small print that these statistics were not adjusted for multiplicity of examinations. And thus, by default, these are not statistically significant different. Thus, you cannot use it to say they are better. Yet they still advertise, look, 60%, you know, maybe 58% of the patients versus 50% of the patients are dry at week four. And they said, look, if we look at week 16 or week 48, remember week 48 is not a whole year. It's really 11 months. A whole year is 52, 54 weeks, okay? So 48 weeks is not a whole year. So we're talking about 11 months. So they said, look, 63 versus 72 percent or 70 versus 60 percent but again they say the end point is not adjusted for multiplicity so there's no statistical significance and the if you look at the area under the curve it's really not much different so basically even the anatomical benefits are not really there clearly they're not statistically significant because they're not adjusted for multiplicity and trust me if if they were Statistically significant after adjustment for multiplicity, they would have told us, okay, it's not that they didn't check. Okay, they had the time, they have the resources to check for multiplicity. It just takes an extra click on the computer. So anatomy tended to be somewhat better without proper statistics. That means no statistical significant difference. But what about the vision? Are we achieving equal vision? Now the study was run as non-inferiority. They said, are we not inferior? And they said, we're not inferior, we're a thin couple of letters, but notice how the area under the curve is always lower than the Q2 months. Thus, the anatomical gains, which are not statistically significant, did not translate to vision gain, but actually slight loss. So here we see the area under the curve is always lower, okay? And on the right here, inside here, we see how many injections. Every two months, it's supposed to get eight injections, but actually patients got seven injections in reality. And in the Q, four months, they're supposed to get five injections, and they got 5.2, and the six, they got 6.1, because some people dropped to less, to shorter intervals. How about safety? Well, it was rather safe. We didn't see any signal. There was a little bit of pressure spikes more often, but that's expected with 70 microliters. So we suggest ocular massage for 20 seconds prior, like you press a little bit on the eye gently for 20 seconds and that, you know, lowers the intraocular pressure. So then we should be okay. So there is, you know, a small problem. Inflammation is about the same. So how were the patients not allowed to adjust intervals? The patients were allowed to drop back, but they were not the same way we do it in clinical practice. They had to have two criteria at the same time fulfilled to tell them, okay, you need an injection. Otherwise, they were forced to go to three months or to four months. So they had to, if they had lost letters, but without changing the, in the fluid, they were not injected. If they had lost less than 25, less or equal to 25 microns of fluid, like you know, uh, there was like an increase in the fluid by 25 microns or less, without vision change, they were not allowed to shorten the interval. So the extended interval was only allowed in the high uh, dose arm. The reduction in the interval had to satisfy two factors together that most people in the practice will not do that. Most people in the practice, they see a little bit more fluid, they will inject, they will not say, don't do that. In any case, it was not fair because you didn't allow the regular dose idea to have the same criteria. And if we remember from the original aflibership study, the post-hoc analysis showed that about half of the patients can go easily every two weeks, every, me, every three months, Q12 weeks. So in reality, the ILEA high dose, the overall reduction in injection was one per year, actually per 11 months, with one letter less vision. But again, this reduction in injection burden, this one less injection, happens because you didn't allow regular dose ILEA to be given with the same rules. So anatomical data, minimal difference, not statistically difference. They don't correlate with better vision. 
in fact, we don't tend to be slightly less. One in five patients continues to need every two months. The four in five patients may go to Q3 or Q4 months, but using more luck criteria than to allow for some mild fluid and mild dropping vision. And at least half of the patients with regular earlier can go to Q3 months. So how much better it is? Really, if you did the trial without handicapping the regular dose ILEA, probably they would have found no difference or minuscule difference. So overall reduction in injection, one per year with one letter less vision. But if you allow for some fluid and some vision drop, maybe same can be achieved with regular dose ILEA. So this is not a fair comparison, but maybe some mild excession in durability can be seen, but it's not proven. Please remember to do ocular massage because it is higher volume, 70 instead of 50 microliters. So that is the ILEA high dose data. One can go through the same literature for diabetic retinopathy and uh, vein occlusions, but that's not the point of our discussion. We're discussing about macular degeneration here. So let's turn pages to the other extended duration drug that has been appeared because of the quote unquote dual target. ILEA can claim also dual target because it is also targeting platelet derived growth factor, PLGF. But if we look at the vitreous level in newly diagnosed patients with the classic vascular disease, microdegeneration, vein occlusion, and diabetic retinopathy, we will see that the angiopoietin 2 levels are not that much higher in AMD compared to controls. Yes, they have a little bit, but they have huge overlap, as we see here. It is mostly in RVO that they kind of tend to be different. Anyways, the company is running out of actually the patent for Lucentis has run out, so they needed something else that is patented. So they combined anti-VGF with anti ns 2 to say we're bispecific, okay? As I said, ILEA can claim it is bispecific. So they said, look, the interval in Tenaga Lucerne, the same like we saw for the ILEA high dose. 80% of the patients could go to Q3, Q4 months. And again, one in five needs every two months. So we see that this is basically disease load here, not drug, okay? So the extended level then again was only allowed in the Farisima bar. And by the way, this study, they only used naive patients. So you cannot extrapolate to non-naive patients. Whereas in ILEA high dose, they allowed non-naive patients as well. So again, same thing from uh, Vabeismo. By the way, although the way they spell it should be called Vabismo, they want us to pronounce it Vabismo as you and I. And then again, they say, look, it appears to dry better. But again, same thing like ILEA high dose statistics not adjusted for multiplicity, so no conclusions can be drawn. And they're forced by the FDA to write that in, in small print. I have it here as well. And they said, look, you know what happens to our CRT? And we see that the lines are about the same, although, again, statistically not significant. Now, they can claim, though, look, you know, our area under the care for the vision is slightly better than ILEA, especially early on. Of course, it trends down. That gap between the two curves is, uh, you, know, is uh, you know, gone by week 48. Again, this is not statistically significant, but we will see something interestingly of how they did the analysis here, okay? How about the safety of Vabaismo? Well, Vabaismo is a little bit more inflammatory. So it has two to three times more the inflammation. So in the Lucerne was 1.8 to 2.4, about twofold. In the Tenaya was 0.6 to 1.5. So it is about twofold overall the inflammation. They had more RP tears. This is the combined result down here, 3% versus 1.4, twice as many RP tears. And a little bit more cataracts, 50% more cataracts with uh, Vabaismo. So it's a little bit less safe than ILEA. A little bit more inflammatory, a little bit more RP tears, a little bit more cataracts. We talked earlier with ILEA high dose about the truth of how truly or not are longer intervals achieved with the newer drugs. But I want to go a little bit uh, deeper in this efficacy data for Vabaismo, because they also claim to have trends towards superior vision. So let's look at the protocol and the design. It's a very interesting 
design that they did here. Uh, so they have their Flibercept on label. Nobody in clinical practice is using a Flibercept on label, but it's on label, three doses every two months. And then the Farisimab, they have a, an arm that goes every two months like a Flibercept, an arm that can go every three months but can drop, and an arm that can go every four months but can drop. Let's look at this bit, you know, this shaded stuff here a little bit more carefully. So what are we going to see here? First of all, there's four loading doses versus three loading doses. So already they're stacking everything in favor of farisimab. They don't go three loading doses, they go four loading doses. So that there is one difference. So they're not apples to apples. Second difference, when they report the vision, they don't report the vision at a single time point, like week 44, week 48. At the end of the study, they average three time points, which one of them is always one month post-injection. So look at this. On the Q, four months, there is a four month time point here, the middle time point. But then there is a time point here, which is one month after an injection, and there's another time point here, which is three months after the injection. So the four month time point is actually one, three and four months together. The three month time point is one month after the previous injection, two months and then three months. So it's Q1, two, three. And the two month time point is actually Q1, Q2, Q1. So look at what they're doing. They're not reporting to you what happens to the vision at the four months or the three months. They're reporting to you what happens to the vision at two, three, four, one, two, three, and one, two, one. But they don't even do that. They measure all this group together. They take the vision of this arm and this arm and this arm together, and they compare it with this arm. So you have no idea what is the visual acuity if somebody was extended to four months? So furthermore, they did something more interesting than ILEA high dose. They don't allow you to drop the patient, to inject the patient, unless the patient drops by, you know, uh, by 50 microns more over the average of the last two visits, not of the last visit, the last two visits, or 75 of the lowest of the last two visits, or lose more than five letters over the average of the last two visits, or 10 over the lowest of the last two visits. So let's look at this. Here's a patient, comes in, his CST is 230, you dried him up by week 12 because they take four months. And they have been injected here because they, they got farisimab for four loading doses. Now, they come back a month later, week 16, and they went up by 30 points, and they lost three letters. Are you allowed to inject? No. How about the next visit? They're now 290. They're another 30 points up, but the average of the last two is 245. 245 is not more than 50 points difference, so you're not allowed to inject, and so forth and so on. And the same thing here with the letters. So this patient here, this hypothetical patient, We'll have to go all the way from 230 to 350 to start injecting. That won't happen in real life. Yet the rules, the protocol will force you to go to four months. And then you can say, look, with Marisimab, the patients go to four months. So then, as we said, they did not show you individually the groups the Q4 months, the Q3 months, and the Q2 months of farisimab, what they do in visual acuity, but they group everybody together and they report that whole mixed vision, which contained always one month post-injection data, which has the best visual acuity. So they allow for too much fluid before allowing shortening of intervals and the vision loss. The outcome is averaging of three time points with one of them always one month post-injection. The vision is not reported separately for the Q3 months or Q4 month cohorts, but merged together with the Q2 months. There's slightly more inflammation, more cataracts and RPTRs. Overall then, what do we gain for all these limitations? Less 
one injection less. But if you allowed similar treatment for ILEA, there will be no difference because nobody does Q2 months ILEA. Everybody does to an extent. So nobody does the number of injections that they allowed here for ILEA regular dose. So not a fair comparison with ILEA. Would not know what happens to vision for the people that they are pushed to Q3 or Q4 months as it was not reported. And the results are limited to 11 months with basically just two intervals. So what is the real life experience? We've tried Babismo at Masaintia, not in, a, in mostly on naive patients, but on patients that they were like frequent visitors to the clinic. And we see, you know, can we extend? And the reality is maybe 10 to 15% of our patients, maybe we can extend by one to two weeks, but with the same vision. So there's no visual, no functional benefit. And maybe some patients, maybe 10, 15 percent, and then probably you know on the general side here of 15 percent, maybe you can extend one or two weeks. But mostly there is no difference. Remember, in the trial, only naive patients were enrolled. Okay. I would like to make a small mention about PDS, as there are more talks about PDS than actual devices implanted in the whole US, and the device has been retracted for now. This is the port delivery system, which you're supposed to refill every six months, but it was recovered. And the previous problem is besides being a surgical trip, it is a threefold higher rate uh, for, in, for infection. And this is a lifetime risk. Remember, we have the endophthalmitis with uh, traps and you know and tubes in glaucoma. So we do we want the same thing in uh, in wet AMD. So summary, overall reduction of one to two injection less compared to on label with an unfair design. But who does on label anymore? So probably there's really no reduction if you compare them everything equal. Nothing beats anti-VGF, dual target, etc. Currently, it's just marketing. Definitely for function, even potentially for duration of an effect, because as we said, the studies with everything stacking in favor of the new drug they were able to reduce by one to two injections maximum and only forcing you to use the other drug on label every two months, which nobody does. We may have reached maximum gains for vision based on treating the wet component. None of the trial does fair comparisons. The emerged data and follow up is not even a year. It's 48 weeks. In real life, people already follow treat and extend. Most current drugs go for longer than label. Duration appears to be more of a patient disease load dependent variable rather than drug dependent. I've heard, I do not know if that's official, but there's discussion that NIH will likely ask future trials to be fair for all arms. That you cannot compare the one arm at different you know, intervals than your drug and then claim that your drug can go longer. So I would like to thank you for this part of the lecture and then we'll go to the dry AMD. Do we have questions for this? Hello? Any questions or should I move to the next? Dr. Vavos, I think you, you can move to the next and okay. we, at the end we do, if, if, if we had time, okay. we Sounds can good. do some questions, okay? Okay. Thank you. So now we have new approved therapy, I should put that in quotation mark, for GA. And I will stay, take a very, you know, clear and open, I will not uh, mince my words, why we should pause and oppose it. In all honesty, there should be no controversy here. People say, oh, it's controversial, the approval. There should be no controversy here. This drug should not have been approved. I would like to thank Professor Spade from New York, who also is vocal about that and doesn't matter what companies say or other conflicts. In 2022, we had this rise of the tests. We had that before, but in 2022, a year ago, FDA approved despite the unanimous opposition of the advisory board from preeminent clinician scientists in the field of Alzheimer, Adu Kanumab, an antibody for Alzheimer's. Despite the fact that there was no functional benefit, extreme risk and side effects, and the expert panel said this drug doesn't help anybody and only harms, yet the FDA went and approved it. There was a huge controversy. Eventually, you know, the company kind of pulled it away. 
and we thought it was like in the news and we hoped that lessons would have been learned. But unfortunately, in 2023, we had a sequel. And in February of this past year, of this year, uh, Pexeracoplan was approved, despite the fact that there was no direct patient benefit and was based completely on a surrogate outcome on interesting statistics. So, and they want us to believe that there is a benefit. How do they want us? They say, look, here on yellow orange is the original, excuse me, the, the final GA area by the drug and the more darker color by the sum. And they say, look at this difference, there is a difference. This is drawn to scale here. The sum had a final GA lesion of 12.19 millimeters of uh, square millimeters. And the monthly injection of the drug had 11.29. So that is actually 7.5% difference, not 22 difference. This 22% is the growth rate. Who cares about that? We care about the final GA lesion. So it's 7.5% difference. And I say, look, isn't that good? We reduced the GA area. I have to emphasize, this is not the GA area. This is the surrogate test, the FAF, the fluorescent, the, excuse me, the autofluorescence, okay? The fundus of fluorescence. And they say, look, this is the difference. This is what then it implies that if I'm looking at the scenery, I will have a scotoma left was the scotoma on the control and on the right is on the sum, the scotoma. And look, this is the difference. That is not perceptible, even if it was real. However, that is proven wrong because there was no difference in microperimetry. So this thing that they want us to believe that, look, what we measure in the FAF will give you a less scotoma and it is not good. It doesn't because the microperimetry was not different. And here's the data. You show, according to them, the growth of the lesion, the curves digress. And we will talk about that because even that is a statistical line. This is not a real line, by the way. This is modeling. This is least square means of MMRM model. These are not real data. But if you see, although these lines digress, the microperimetry is the same. So there is no difference. Maybe there is more other functional benefit. So, OK, visual acuity, not better or lost, close to the lines. Contrast sensitivity, which everybody complains, not evaluated, and I think on purpose. Dark adaptation, which everybody complains, not evaluated, and I also think on purpose. Low luminance. No difference. Low luminous deficit, no difference. Reading speed, no difference. Reading independence index, no difference. Vi visual function questionnaire, no difference. Microperimetry, no difference. Now, for months, although a lot of us were asking, show us the data at the end, finally it was published data. And here it is. The monthly injections, they lost one extra letter to sum. The every other month, they lost two extra letters to sum. And look at this, monocular maximum reading speed, minus three, minus two, means worse than the sum. Functional reading independence, worse than the sum. Normal luminance, best corrected visual acuity, worse than the sum. National functional questionnaire, worse. Mean threshold macular sensitivity, worse. Okay, so not one, but six different functional tests fail to show any benefit, even a small one. Actually, they all trend less. So the cost, per quality of life adjusted years is infinite. What do the patients themselves think? Almost a third of the patients dropped out from the monthly treatment. If it was helping them, they would have stayed. Think about anti-VGF like Lucentis. Think about Viagra. Contrast that to Lucentis trials or even Mycogen, which had weak but real functional effects. No difference in visual function questionnaire, which is validated in AMD and numerically was worse for Pexodacopla. Clearly, patients did not feel any benefit. Now, do we want to be treating a test with that much risk, anatomical adjusted quality cost, and zero benefit? Small parenthesis, because many downplay the conversion of exudative to exudative AMD, arguing that we convert an untreated disease into a treatable one. If we look at the Philly, the phase two trial, because that was the only available till literally last week, patients lost 11 letters or 14 letters compared to six. Remember, people that convert to wet AMD with anti-VGF, they gain five to 10 letters. Here they lost despite treatment. 
this. And finally, the results from Oxford Derby, finally they, were, they saw that at Retina Society this past week, and you lose 13 letters and 11 letters. Look at that. You lose. Remember the anti-VGF trials we gain. Here we lose despite treatment. Because a lot of people go, oh, we're converting an untreatable disease to a treatable disease. They lose vision. Despite all these people still can't shake it off. All these people with conflict of interest. They even claim that we can't measure functional endpoints because of the nature of the disease. But the literature and their own study disproves that. We can measure decline in several functional tests in GA patients as the GA lesion size grows. Auction Derby did detect significant change in these functional outcomes over two years. Thus, we're not limited in the ability to detect changes if they were there. Here are papers outside of the study that they have shown that. And thus, they remind us of, have your cake and did it too. You can't both say you will use a surrogate measure and then assert that the surrogate measure cannot be related to function. Because by definition, we use a surrogate measure when it is found to have a good correlation with a functional outcome. Then the surrogate measure itself may become an acceptable outcome measure. Furthermore, because everybody gets stuck still with a surrogate, although clearly the study shows that there is no relationship between that, what they measure and they present it to function, everybody, but, 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 but. But even the surrogate test measure is inflated, inaccurate, and distorted. It is inflated because of the imbalances in the proportion of patients not completing treatment. In the monthly, 30% of the people did not complete treatment. So earlier measure points are used and worse patients drop off more often than well-performing ones. The company denies to show us the baseline characteristics of the people that drop out, to show that they're equally distributed in the both arms. Second problem, there is interference by the higher conversion to wet AMD. When you convert to wet AMD and you have fluid, you measure a smaller dark FAF because the fluid increases your FAF. They do not answer how they measure the GA lesion when there's fluid. Accurately, you can't. Third problem, the autofluorescence, even if it is high, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have healthy RPE. It could more easily mean that you haven't cleared sick junctional RPE, and that's why it doesn't correlate with functional outcome. Then there's other look. We also look at the photoreceptors. They preserved. Well, they did not measure photoreceptors. They measured outer segment thickness. They did not measure photoreceptor bodies, ONL nuclei, the top of the easy line and the outer boundary of the third hyperreflective outer retinal band. That's what they measured in the paper. That could easily mean that you didn't phagocytose your photoreceptor outer segment because complement is involved in the phagocytosis. Still, consultants for the company and others put up mostly emotional arguments that the drug is good. It's exciting new treatment. We have nothing better. It's game changer. Don't you think that the right patient but novelty is not innovation. No progress is there if you only have risk without functional benefit. Game changer for who? The company to make money or for the patients? And thoughts against data is not evidence-based medicine. Oh, don't you think this? Don't you think that? It's irrelevant what I think. It is what it is. We have to start from somewhere, they say, similar to FDT and Markinchen. Well, Mark Twain said, get your facts first, then you can distort them as you please. Let's start picking from the truth and not harming the patient. PDT and Mycogen, they used functional data for approval, not surrogate without function. Both saw the reduction in percent of people losing more than three lines of vision. Where is that seen with the new drug? PDT and Mycogen also had better risk profile. They say, isn't it logical that if we treat longer, we will see bigger difference and thus less phobia loss and more functional benefit. Why wait? What kind of an argument is that? I, mean, I forgot about that, yes. The thought experiments, why face reality? Just think about it. Forget about the evidence-based medicine. Yogi Berra, a famous American baseball player, 
said in theory there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. We can say whatever we want as thoughts. We have to do the experiments. Many times we've proven wrong. For years, they were saying that we shouldn't give beta blockers to heart failure patients. It was malpractice. I remember my professors in medical school. It was found to be wrong. For years, they were doing optic nerve sheath fenestration. It was proven to be wrong. And so many other things that we thought it's right, but it was not right. In science, it is not what we think, but what it is. If we go by what we think, why the trials? Just approve things on thought experiments and consensus. As we expect in long term, the difference in geographic atrophy region to be larger, so too the risks will increase over time and may easily negate any potential gain. The advertised future benefit is potential, theoretical, but the risk is real. We know it is there. Well, they say maybe not for everybody, but the right patient. Magically determined by the powers of the doctor without data. Now we're so smart, we're so good. We don't need data. We can figure it out. We have the sixth and seventh sense, all from post hoc analysis, which is not powered nor balanced. They said, how about, you know, if there is a non phobia LGA, let's reduce the risk of affecting the phobia. Or let's take the monocular patient who has lost the phobia in the other eye and let's preserve driving vision for longer. Well, okay. Let's look at the data. Did they show any less patients to lose foveal fixation? No. They looked for that. No. Did they show no more less patients to lose driver's license? No. Did less patients lose more than three lines of vision? No. And even if sometimes they show you guys some graphs quickly, make sure that they are statistically significant with balanced baseline subgroups. They never do that. Furthermore, monocular patients with preserved phobia, have the most to lose if they get one of the many significant side effects. You don't get neovascularization in geographic atrophy, you get it where you have tissue. So, post hoc analysis is hypothesis generating, not proof. When we do post hoc subgroups, we break down the randomization and balance of risk factors. And if you pick a subgroup that shows better results, that only means that the subgroup you're not showing did worse on the treatment group. Here is the post hoc in the Mahalo, okay? Because here they show this post hoc in the Pekisatako plan, okay? But no statistics shown, no baseline characteristics shown, okay? In post hoc in Mahalo, Mahalo was the complement factor D. They said, look, if you have the CFI risk factor, then you do better, okay? But when they did the actual randomization, there was no difference. Okay. When you do post hoc, it's easily because there are so many factors that they control GA lesion, multifocality, location, uh, size, you know, uh, age, smoking, this, that. When you, you are randomized for the whole group of the 300 patients, when you go down to a fourth of your patients, your randomization is not there, period. So these are honest patient, doctor questions and answers. I don't think anybody can claim different than this. Patient, doctor, will this new drug improve my vision? No, it will not improve your vision. It's a fact. Data show vision will continue to decline over two years, losing almost two lines of vision, and probably slightly more if you take the drug. At least, will it prevent me from losing more vision? Unfortunately, data, this is not my opinion, data did not show any prevention from losing more vision. In fact, if you get one of the serious complications, you will be more likely to lose vision. Okay, but will it prevent me from getting wet MD? Unfortunately, you are more likely to develop wet MD if you take the drug, and you may lose even more vision. Geographic atrophy is indeed a huge burden for our patients. A treatment that requires frequent injections with no functional benefit, with significant risk, imposes additional burden. Again, the side by side, the FAF lesions do not translate to microperimetry no functional benefit, four times the exudation, 20 times the inflammation, infinite times the optic ischemic neuropathy. Ah, by the way, I don't keep talking about that, but there's also more deaths, okay? So it's all pain, no gain. And I did not talk about the occlusive vascularity. They don't have to go over this. The occlusive vascularity is probably more than they claim one in 10,000, probably one in 1,000, one in 2,000. And it is possible that the ischemic, ischemic optic neuropathy, 0.5 to 2%, and the inflammation, 2 to 4%, are 
are the less bad examples of the more rare and devastating occlusive vasculitis of no light perception. First, do no harm from antiquity. There's a price to pay for speaking the truth. There's a bigger price for living a lie. Perception of how far flesia may translate as scotoma not panning out in microperimetry. No functional gain. Increased exudation, inflammation, ischemic optic neuropathy, deaths in the monthly, and the bad vasculitis. Let us pause. Surrogate is a surrogate only if it relates to function. Always be careful with too much statistical manipulation to show surrogate test effects. Post hoc subgroups are not balanced for risk and thus not proof of an effect. You can always pick a subgroup that shows better results. We want to treat patients and their function, not emotions, not wishful thinking. It's interesting to me. They put all these emotional arguments. I'm the great. I'm supposed to have emotion. And I'm speaking about cold, hard data. It is evidence-based medicine, not thought-based medicine. Use it in trials only. Assess important functional aspects such as contrast sensitivity and dark adaptation. Include genetic risk information as well as pertinent biomarkers. Examine the role of complement and genetics may be more supportive for a role of complement at other stages. Geographic atrophy is indeed a huge burden. Not impose additional burden with something that has zero functional benefit and only risk. One in five patients will get some problem. 12% exudation, 4% inflammation, 2% ischemic optic neuropathy in the monthly group, and 10% in the every other monthly group. Think about that for nothing, for nothing. Thank you very much.